And we're live. Love and abundance, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to the What's Your Story show. This is your host, Dr. Varun Nitin Gandhi. Again, love and abundance. I welcome everyone that's joining in to you know, post a comment below, say hello, share where you're coming in from. I'd love to hear from you. If you have questions throughout this interview, we have a fascinating conversation coming up. If you have any questions throughout this interview, please feel free to, sh to write in the comments below. Share where you're calling in from where you're, uh, or where you're uh, writing from. And um, you know, we'd love to hear from you. So before I get started with the show, really want to quickly do a water ritual. So when uh, our guest comes on, I'll do it then. Uh, I'm going to really quickly do it at the beginning of the show as well. Uh, cheers to everyone. We all know why I do this. So I'm not going to, again, repeat myself. But cheers to everyone that's tuning in. Uh, take a sip. Take a big, big, big sip uh, and drink to your fill. A reminder for everyone to drink more water. All right. So this show... You know, as usual, we're talking about stories that are within the, the Indian subcontinent and the, the whole community. And you know, we're discussing challenges, we're discussing issues, uh, stereotypes, certain things we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about how we can support, unite each other, come together, build ourselves up and our community. Uh, you know, in, in this show, we discuss paths that are not usually heard, of, heard about. And today's guest, uh, Matt, is actually going to talk about something that we normally don't hear about, you know, far and few in between. Uh, again, everyone that's tuning in, questions below in the comments, uh, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, tag your friends, bring more people into this conversation. I really want everyone to hear this because we are going to be talking about the challenges that the global hu hum uh, Hindu community face on an ongoing basis. You know, all of us are living in a little... Uh, bubbles everywhere. We're not really aware of what's going on outside of these bubbles. So today we're going to have some tough conversations on what's really going on. We're going to have a conversations on how we can get involved, what we can do, uh, how can we apply Hinduism to the environment. That's a great, a fascinating conversation that I, I never thought about, I so I don't know anything about it. I'm going to learn a lot about that today. Uh, so let me welcome our guest, uh, Matt McDermott, uh, to the stage. Matt, welcome so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, one Thank person you. in the background was Thanks. screaming. <laughs> okay. Hey, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head, head this off here. Let's do it. Cheers. Okay. Ah, fantastic. Let's go. Thank you so much for being here, Matt. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Doing well. It's nice and warm right. out today. Yeah, it's nice and warm. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I did. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, you are the Senior Director of Communications at the Hindu American Foundation. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining the show. Thank you for all that you do through the organization on your own, your advocacy and everything that you're doing for the, the Hindu global community. And you know, we really appreciate it, and I want to share that from the bottom of my heart and everyone that's tuning in that you know, we really value your contribution and the organization's contribution to the, the global Hindu community. No, uh, so you. the first question is, uh, Matt, what's your story? How did you get into Hinduism? I mean, this is such a – it feels like it's so yeah. far away. Um, that's a long story. I'll try to do the, the short version. Um, no, no, keep it long. Would, keep it long? Okay. More stories. Well, <laughs> More stories, fine. Um, I I was raised Catholic. Um, I grew up in Connecticut, and um, I was not particularly religious growing up at all. I was always like questioning everything, um, not in like a in an obnoxious way, but I just it just never really resonated with me. And I actually pretty much walked out of confirmation class, which is for those who don't know, is sort of a it's like when you're sort of formally enter Catholicism, like as you're like, you know, like not quite a teen. And I was just said, I don't want to do this. I don't believe this. So I'm not going to do this anymore. And I'm not part of this. And that was it. And it was a, you know, it was the type of thing we had to hide from my grandparents a little bit because my parents were in my family was fairly involved in the Catholic church. Like I had an uncle who was a bishop on Long Island. I had people who were monks. 
um, in the family. And it, it, and, the, and my grandparents on my father's side were particularly religious, very religious. Like, so it, it was a bit of a shock. Um, and that was, I think that entered a period or started off a period rather of just sort of seeking, you know, just like reading stuff as you do, as most people do, I think when they're a late teenager and somewhere then in like the early nineties, I just sort of came across it. I like came across, started reading about yoga, started reading, like it actually came in like through the beat generation, like Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, all those, all those people who were sort of the predecessors to the hippies. Some of the first Westerners to like embrace Indian thought, you know, and a lot of those went sort of to, to Buddhism more than, more than Hinduism, but that was in the mix too. So I just started reading about it and it just sort of all resonated with me, um, particularly the work of Shivaya Subramunya Swami, the former head of the monastery in Kauai, publishers of Hinduism today. So I came in really resonating with that Saiva Siddhanta tradition rather than most white dudes who come into Hinduism, come into ISKCON or something. I was aware of that because like I grew up, as I said, in Connecticut, I was skateboarding all the time, listening to punk rock. And at that time, that was a time of like shelter. If anybody knows about shelter, Ray Capo, who Ray Capo then, Raghunath Capo now, uh, I, that's what he goes by now, Ray of today, youth of today and all those bands. So there was a whole Krishna core scene and like it's hard music, but singing about Krishna. And so I was aware of that as a teenager before, but it was just sort of on the periphery, you know, and it wasn't until like a little bit later that I sort of dove deep in and I just read about it. I invited, I started doing yoga, started meditating like all the time and reading whatever I could. And it just sort of took me over, you know, it all made sense. I sometimes say to people that the stuff that some people say are like paradoxes or hard to understand about Hinduism just made intuitive sense to me. So I never had that like struggle with, well, I don't know. Like there is like, I was always, the symbolism all made sense. It all just sort of really resonated. So that, that was it. I mean, I sort of lived with it for a long time for maybe like a decade. And then it was like sometime in like the early 2000s where I was just like, after I'd been to India a couple of times actually, where I was like, well, this is what I, I am. For a long time, like many people today, especially, I'd be like, well, I'm spiritual, but not religious. You know, or if, some, if I, I'd hem and haw a little bit more, but like, well, if I followed any path, well, it would be Hinduism, but I wouldn't actually then like step through the door and be like, this is who I am. And then once I did, that's where I am. So that's the, the medium length story of that. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. So you came in and uh, how was your initial experience with meditation and yoga? Like what kind of changes did you see happening? Uh, in your life? Um, that, that's, that's good. I mean, we have to go back, back to the before times, not even before COVID times, but the before yoga works, before a yoga studio on every corner, before Lululemon, this is like the early 1990s. And I was living in Vermont and I think there were three Indian people in the entire state of Vermont and there were five people that did yoga, you know? So I'm learning yoga from a book. This is pre YouTube. The internet is still dial up. So there's oh, none of this, but I had, you know, like a Shivananda yoga book that I found someplace. And I was just like, okay, I'm going to read this. I can see what they're doing. It had instruction in it. So I would do it. And when it was the same thing with meditation, it's like, okay, what does this say? Let me see if I can do this. You know, and I did. Um, and I, for a long time, I practiced single every single day, you know, just what it was. Um, and I had a lot of experience, a lot of good experience with that. I mean, I actually really early on, I sort of forget about this, but I had this experience. I really just don't know how to describe. I was sitting there meditating and I felt like this flash come over me. Like, it felt like my head opened up and I described it at the time and still to this day, I can feel it. I almost passed out and I felt like all knowledge of the universe just like went <laughs> and I didn't know what to do with it. And I just like fell over on the bed because I was sitting on the bed meditating. And I was just like, whoa, what was that? And I've never had anything that intense ever since in meditation. Meditation has been a completely calming, usual thing for me. But that one time I must've been like 19 maybe. And it was just, it was like, wow. whoa, there's something here. Okay. 
Yeah. Was that drugs or anything? It was just through meditation. No, no, that, that, that was not drugs. I, I, I have done some drugs in my life, but no, that was not. That was like straight up sober. I was just sitting there. I don't know if I was unloaded, certainly cross-legged meditation, mind opening experience. And have you, uh, I know you haven't felt that before or again since then, but do you know what that was now, many years later? No, you tried I, I, I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what it was because sometimes I feel like it's better not knowing, just sort of intuiting it rather than being like, well, this is what it is because I have that experience and what, and it was a positive experience and I don't want to sort of debunk that experience there's sometimes right i don't know so you don't analyze it too much you just let it be as it i is. i don't i i mean we're going back 20 years you know so right. maybe i did at the time but i don't really want to it was just a powerful thing that i experienced a meditation that for some reason just popped up now i never share that one but it was interesting oh. and then uh, uh so now you en entered hinduism and where has your journey led you thus far? I know you're like, like now you're heavy into advocacy. And yeah. Um, after I sort of stepped through the door, as it were, I really, this is, I'll tell the story how I came to HAF and the advocacy part, but it, it comes through Hinduism today. And I, I was working at Treehugger at the time. Um, people who know the site with the website treehugger.com, I was one of the editors there. And at the time it was owned by Discovery Channel. Now it's independent again. And I was writing an article on biofuels and a plan by, I believe it was Tyson, one of the major meat manufacturers, like meat processors, who were developing this biofuel from essentially factory farm waste. And I was just like, this is not a good idea. This is just, I, I, I got some, <clears throat> excuse me, some sympathy for reusing waste products, but I'm like, this is a waste product of something that shouldn't exist. This is just like rampant cruelty that we really shouldn't be making anything out of this. We, this shouldn't exist. So I was writing, it was a short article and I got a, and I wanted a Hindu perspective on this just for the article as a journalist, as you know, an advocacy journalist, I wanted someone else to say what was in my, what, what I was thinking just so I wasn't pontificating the whole time. I mean, that was part of my job, but this wasn't that sort of article. So I, I emailed them for comment. And I told them about it and we got going back and forth and I started writing for them. They asked me to start writing, I believe it was an article on that. And then I wrote some articles on Hinduism in the environment for them. They had like an educational one, I did that. And for a number of years, I was writing articles for them. And through that, I got into the Hindu advocacy part because I was asked to give a Hindu viewpoint at this conference in New York City, is a, a very short conference. I believe it was called Faith and Food. It was put on by a British organization that no longer exists. Um, the people are still doing advocacy, but it's morphed a bit. And I went to this, but I it had to be vetted for my Hinduness, I guess, because here's this white dude that's coming in. We don't know who he is. He's gonna be speaking for all of Hinduism, by the way. Whenever somebody says, speak for all of Hinduism, I'm like, wait, wait, wait. That, that you can't do that. There's like 1. Point whatever billion you know, yeah. for their, their, and there are 1.2 billion different views. So I'm not gonna speak for everyone. But in any case, I was like, okay, I can speak about this in general. But I was vetted, one by Sheetal Shah, who is now, I would say, a, you know, a good friend. And she's one of the managing, now one of the managing directors of HAF. And by Gopal Patel, who is was living in the UK at the time and was uh, working at the Bhumi Project, which was at the Oxford Center for Hindu Studies. And they said, they, I guess, decided I was Hindu enough and I knew what I was talking about. So I showed up at this conference representing Hinduism with the stamp of approval of HAF saying he's good enough, the monks in Hawaii saying, okay, he knows what he's talking about, and the Bhumi Project saying, okay, he's good enough. So that was the first thing that I went to as a Hindu advocate, air quotes. Um, and it just went from there. I pretty quickly moved on to working with Boomi Project, a good deal. We uh, did a lot of environmental work. Um, we produced the second Hindu declaration on climate change, which was in 2015, went to, it was presented to the president of France and it's all tied into the UN conference. I actually contributed a little bit to the first Hindu declaration on climate change in 2009 that the Hinduism Today monks organized and went, was presented in Melbourne. 
in, in Australia. But that was, that was a much smaller thing in terms of my involvement. The second one, I was the author on. I was the lead author on, and we worked with Boomi Project and HAF, and we did that. We also we did work with the greening temples, like trying to get temples, mostly in the Northeast, because that's where I was living at the time in New York, to sign up for renewable energy, to do all these things. And so I was out in the streets meeting with, going from temple to temple saying, hey, can you do this? And that was through Green Faith, which is another organization. It's a multi-faith environmental organization, which generally does pretty good work. Don't do that much work with them anymore just because they have to start taking over my my world. And we also helped organize the Hindu contingent of the People's Climate March in New York City, which was like, you know, 500,000 people in the streets of New York. You're in the middle wow. of history. Um, we also, through that, were one of, part of a march on the Vatican after the Pope issued um, his encyclical on the environment, which is a good, doc good document, very Christian Catholic document that if I want to theologically pick apart, I can, but the intention is good. We want to have a good planet. We want people to have a good life. But we went through Green Faith to, to Rome, a bunch of Hindus as part of this. And we were one of the first groups that the Pope actually allowed us to march into St. Peter's Square. You know, like you see, if you've ever seen it, for some reason, um, one wow. of the, what do you call it? Um, Dan Brown movies is popping into my head, like uh, the Da Vinci Code ones. And they're in the middle of St. Peter's Square. I'm like, I've been there. We marched into there as a group of people, of different people, of different faiths coming in. The Pope wel welcomed us in from this little window that he's up there. And they apparently never do that. We walk up with all these banners and the guards just like, part, and everyone comes. Yeah, that was good. Um, so after that, I'm still, this is my story. I guess it's longer than I thought. We, I, I love it. Oh. I, I sort of stepped over the line. I was with Boomi Project still. This was a volunteer thing, largely. I mean, expenses paid for because I was doing other work at the time. Originally, I was still on staff at Discovery Channel. And then I was at the Omega Institute in upstate New York, if people know what that, that is. And my time in Omega was coming to an end for a variety of reasons. And one of the people that was from HAF in Rome was leaving HAF and said, hey, we got this job. And I applied for a job, which was different than what I had. And HAF said, I found out later that when they saw my application came, come in, Sue Hogg, the executive director, Sheetal, were like, whoa, did you just see who applied? But for the position. So they created this job for me, this job that I have now, which is officially seen at the time it was director. Now it's senior director of communications because I've been there for six years now. And that was it. I stepped over the line. I, was, I, I had been working with some HAF people in, in an increasing capacity for a number of years. Um, and that was it. You know, and, and I, I guess I've been there uh, ever since. Um, yeah, that's it. Oh, man, that's amazing. I love that story. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, you know, what, uh, so diving deeper with HAF, what kind of work are they involved in right now? Um, I'll try to avoid giving you elevator pitches and the stock phrases if anybody can look up on the website. Um, HAF really works. There are, two, there are two parts of it. There's like the education side and the, and the sort of advocacy policy side. And there's, they're very much interrelated. They sometimes feel both internally, to be frank, and out in the public as they're at odds. They're two different things because the education stuff, we work with schools, we work, we produce content, we produce a podcast, which you were on, we produce all sorts of blogs, articles, educational materials to teach people about Hinduism, not from a religious sense specifically, because HAF doesn't follow or fall into any one lineage. You know, there are people at HAF that are coming from a Shaivite perspective. There are people, a lot of people came through Chinmaya Mission. We've got one person who is ISKCON. We've got other people on staff who were raised Hindu, and that's about it. They're culturally Hindu, but you know that's where that's where it is for them. They're not. They don't have some deep religious practice, and I'm not outing anybody in that. It's just the way it is, and they'll they'll be upfront about it. Um, so our educational materials take a very broad perspective because religious literacy in the U.S. is pretty bad, even for people that are of uh, the majority of religions, you know, which have much more high numbers of followers. People just don't know that much. 
It's not just about Hinduism. So there's a lot of need for that in society in the US. So we produce that content, but then we also do work on harder policy issues. You know, like whether it's like immigration reform and stuff, we've advocated for the end of country green card caps. Um, I don't know if you know about that, but each country under the US system, there's so many that are allotted to each country and it's not proportional to the number of applicants. So say if you come from, I'm just gonna make this up, I may be wrong on the specific example, but come from Ethiopia, there are not that many people applying necessarily. But if you come from India, there are thousands and thousands and thousands. So that person from Ethiopia gets their green card pretty quickly or can. But from India, you can be waiting years just because of the way the system's set up. And we, we try to, uh, we encourage reform in that. We also do some foreign policy stuff with like, making sure like us india relationship is pretty strong we try to advocate for human rights issues where hindus are in a minority so we do reports on like bangladesh we do a report on pakistan malaysia sri lanka we do for a while bhutan was a, an issue because there was a hindu minority there that w wasn't being treated that well um we also do a report it was just published today in 2021 on the now union territory of Jammu and Kashmir. You know, it, we, because Hindus are a minority in that state in right. India. So we, we do that work too. And that's, it's frankly really pretty heavy. It's a much, yeah. it's a much different feeling. So we, we, we try to do all that. I mean, we, we do basic community stuff too. You know, it's like, how do you get Diwali on your school calendar? You want, you've got enough Hindus in the area and you want your school to give the kids this holiday off. We have like templates to be like, this is how you can email. This is how the process generally works. We don't do that work ourselves, but we give people the tools that if you have enough, a critical mass of people in the area that want this, this is how you go about it. Oh, uh, okay. So it's like a kit, like this is how you step yeah, by step. There, there, yeah, it's called, we have a Diwali toolkit, which has that. and also has materials for educators or parents to say, this is how schools can teach about Diwali. Because in the US, you can't really talk about it. You can say, this is what, it's celebrated. And we, in ours includes stuff on how Hindus celebrate this, how the corresponding Sikh holidays that, that go along with it at the same time are celebrated. It's just basic. I mean, it would be DEI stuff, really, and, you know, diversity, equity and inclusiveness as much as anything else, because we just people don't know and people want this information. Yeah, yeah that's very important. You know, now that we're talking about schools, uh, you know, I've had this thought that I've been contemplating for the last, uh, this, this year or so. And it's been about, uh, how can we get yoga meditation, some yeah. form of it into, uh, call into colleges, into schools, into, you know, different levels. Like what's that way mm -hmm. of getting that? Cause I think there's a lot of benefit that, there. Yeah. There, I think there definitely is. Um, colleges are different than younger schools and private institutions are different than, um, public institutions. Colleges is much easier because you can have all sorts of groups and you're not in college, you're not compelled to do anything. In younger grades, it's different, but it can totally be done. In my son's school here in Malibu, which is up in the mountains, they do yoga in school at least once a week, like asana classes. Even in New York City public schools where my son was before, before the pandemic, they meditated every day at the start of it. It was a, he had a Vietnamese teacher who would sit them down at the beginning. I don't know if it was every day, but several times a week. And we're just going to breathe, you know, this is, it, but it bumps up against something that is somewhat difficult from like a Hindu advocacy perspective. Cause once you start saying we're doing meditation, somebody's going to be like, Oh, you're teaching religion. You know, you're doing yoga. There's a fine line to walk with between campaigns that HAF has done before my time at HAF about making sure people recognize the Hindu roots of yoga say, and then saying, we want yoga in school because we're telling people that, hey, this is a religious practice or can be a religious practice, but we want you to also do this in schools because it's got great health benefits. You know, it's a fine line to walk. And I think the way that public schools have to do it is for better and worse, you have to sort of strip out that religion part. You have to say, you can mention this is where this comes from, but we're just going to stick to asana. Or when it comes to meditation, we're just going to use de-religionized, whatever that word is, 
terms for it, you know? Um, you know, I, I've seen it recently as like cardio coherence breathing or something, which is a non Sanskrit clinical term for pranayama, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so that has, that on one hand, that's bad because it's sort of, it's delinking a tradition that's got thousands of years of practice to this day, not just historically from, you know, from those roots. But at the same time, as somebody who used to teach yoga, I want as many people to do this as possible. And if I can get you in through the door, taking that out, at least because of this, the, the system in the US of schools, I'm okay with that. It's an imperfect solution. I'll give you yeah. that. But yeah, people will have benefits. Right. I've seen that in Alabama as well, where they had it stripped out yes. all of the chanting and stripped out the mantras yeah. and all the Sanskrit yeah. out of it. Right. And yeah. uh, they introduced yoga. Back. Yeah. They, 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 yeah. The, Al the Alabama bill was taking, taking out the Sanskrit names was, I felt like that even went too far because Sanskrit, despite its history as a liturgical language, Sanskrit was also used for many totally secular things. The language cool. itself is not religious. The language, yeah. you know, is, is yeah. secular, even if yeah, it's used in a religious way. It's like it's like Latin. Latin was used in the Catholic Church in, up until in the 1960s, sometime when they right. switched over to vernacular languages, not Latin languages. But it was used for all sorts of things. So why, why oh. can't the Sanskrit names be used if the teacher wants? You know, right. you don't have to go right. into all the stories about it about a particular yeah. pose. You don't have to go into, a, who, you know, Virabhadrasana or Vishwamitrasana. You don't have to like go into the mythology or the symbolism around that. You can just say what it is. Yeah. Yeah, you know that you mentioned about uh, the the goods and the bads about, you know, accepting, removing, stripping out that Hinduism component yeah. from the meditation, right? Well, I had one of the questions was, I mean, I, I've been on the fence as well. like. Do I care that, uh, you know, yeah, you're stripping out the Hindu component from yoga, from meditation, but is that essential for me to include it in these schools and colleges? And yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd been contemplating that question. And how did you go yeah. about that? <laughs> um, I mean, uh, me or HAF? HAF uh, has a lot of lawyers, was founded by one of the co-founders, a lawyer. We have managing director as a lawyer. There are a whole bunch of us on staff who think we're lawyers. You know, so like we're pretty good at parsing these things and know it. So the HAF position on yoga in public schools is based upon where the lines are uh, based on existing law. I mean, personally, I go back and forth. It's totally contextual. Like I try to just sort of feel out people. Like if somebody, if it feels like somebody is trying deliberately to strip something out, I'll get really annoyed. But if there's somebody that I can, I know, knows the, knows the full story about it, but for some reason is choosing to downplay it. I'm, I don't, I don't go in it so much. Like even somebody like Deepak Chopra, who get, who's gotten, gets a lot of flack sometimes from the Hindu community, you know, and there's a whole debate between one of AJF co-founders and Deepak back in the day around the Take Back Yoga campaign. And I've interviewed him, you know, I've spoken with him in years since he's been on, uh, we, we had some webinar, we had a webinar with him. And I know he's worked with some people that I trust that know, that know what they're talking about. I, I spoke at an event with him, him once at Ganesh Chaturthi in New York. He knows what he's talking about. You know, so like, I, <laughs> it feels weird. I'll forgive him. I used to be angry a little bit, being like, why are you taking this out? Why can't you say the word Hindu? He was very uncle. It was just like, why can't you say the word Hindu? You're just stripping it of all this stuff. But then I realized like how much he actually knows. And I feel like his heart is in the right place and he's using it to get people in the door. And once you open that door, if people step through it, hopefully they keep going. And then, and it's just beyond the surface. Like I did a meditation event, like retreat at his center down in, uh, down San Diego once. And I, once you were through, I was like, oh, wait, this is just Hinduism. Anybody that like has read anything, you're like, this is just what you're teaching. You may not say it as the first thing, but you're, and you're hinting at it the second thing and you're saying it as the third. So if that's the situation, I'm okay with it. Generally, 
it's just contextual. Like I don't have a hard, I, I judge each situation on its merits. And I try to give people the benefit of the doubt until I know otherwise. That makes sense. I like that answer. Like it's, uh, you know, just based on the situation. I think that's, uh, yeah, that's how I should do it as well. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah. I find that people, some people don't know they're doing it. If I know you know you're doing it and you've been told and you still keep doing it, then I'm angry at you. Right. You know? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, there's, there's like all those brands that are putting the, the images on different parts of the body, like clothing. Yeah. And... Yeah. I mean, that's something we deal with at HF that somehow fell into my wheelhouse, you know? Um, and sometimes I get it. I mean, personally, I'm really liberal about it. Like small L liberal. Like I'm, I got Hindu tattoos in places that some people would be, no, you shouldn't put it out there. Like on my leg or something. It's below my heart or something. I don't care. You know, like to me, it's an act of devotion, you know, and that's fine with me. I don't, my son, his favorite t-shirt is a Ganesh t-shirt that I got on some, some like roadside stall in Carolyn, you know, like there are people that would be even angry at that, you know, and I try to take a very liberal view. I got a thick skin about it. And I, if it's coming from a good place, it's okay. But there are other times where I'll be like, you know, you can't go around putting Ganesh on a bath mat. Or, you know, perhaps on the crotch of underwear isn't okay. People are going to be upset. And I've gotten answers from everything from, oh, we really didn't know. And like, we'll take that down. Sorry. We just didn't, we genuinely didn't know. To one time somebody told me, and I can't remember the vendor. He said, I'm not doing it. I need the money. I'm just selling it anyway. Too bad. Wow. That's... And then they just kept doing it. <laughs> Yeah, they, they just kept doing it. Yeah. Wow. So, I, I, and, and you can't judge who, yeah. you know, um, who's going to react some way. Like other times I've had, I think it was like some beer company, some, some craft brewery. I think it was Ganesh. And they're like, oh, what could we do? Like we want an elephant on there. Like, can yeah. you help me out? You know, to like something that like evoked a same feeling. They don't want to cause offense or anything. Personally, right. I don't get it. I don't really get offended because like many Hindus in the United States, I drink, you know, um, but they were very, uh, they were open, you know, and that was good to see, you yeah. know, so that, yeah. that goes back to the, I've done enough of it that I give people, as I said, the benefit of the doubt until I know otherwise, right. you know? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, I like that. They were open to modifying it in some way. And, you know, yeah. I, I wear t-shirts with Ganesh on it or, you know, some god on it and things like that. I yeah. use it as a reminder, you know, whenever I look at yeah. myself in the camera, I'm like, oh, it's a good reminder for myself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think it's, it helps out. It helps me out at least. Uh, so we're talking about Hindus. What are the biggest challenges that Hindus face? Uh, you know, we'll start with America, and then I, we mentioned you sure. mentioned a few other countries around the world. Yeah. But we'll start with America. Um, I think the biggest one in America is probably just being understood. It's who Hindus are and what Hindu beliefs are. There's mm -hmm. still a lot of misconceptions, not at least in how it's portrayed in the media. I mean, that was one of the things I was hired with at HIF. It's a long-term job addressing inaccuracies. Whether it's points of history, like there was actually a temple in the Yodhya before the Babri Mas Masjid was put on top of it. You know, oh. there was something there. It, oh. wasn't, it didn't just come out of nowhere, which isn't to, we'll leave aside, should it have been turned down? Everything of that. But when that issue in particular gets reported on, it starts with, there was a mosque, it got torn down. It wasn't, there was a temple here for a long time. Oh. And that got torn down. And then something got torn down which again, not advocating for violent tearing down mosques or anything, make no mistake about this, but you have to acknowledge the history. So there's issues like that. I mean, I would like to say the easy answer would be something like hate crimes or something, but it's just not, the stats on hate crimes in the US, something like, it's more than you want, like but 50% of Hindus have never had anything like that. I've right. never had an untoward incident. It's not as high as some other communities. Um, not to downplay the people that have. You know, racism is prevalent in the United States. Otherism, in the sense of just xenophobia. You look different than me. Right. But 
you know, that's not something that we deal with that sporadically. The bigger issues are ones of education and getting people to understand that when a Hindu puts a swastika above their door, they're not a neo-Nazi. That issue comes up. That's one we've been dealing with, not specifically above your door, but bills that have come up in in the Trump era. They've just been ramping up and they're still going about lumping in all Dharmic faiths use of the swastika with mm-hmm. with Hitler. The language often is just the swastika. And Hindus rightly raise their hand and go, hey, wait, 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 wait. You know, we use it this way. Um, so we work with legislators to, to nuance the language, to say like the Nazi emblem. Or really we try to, we're increasingly trying to point out that, that Hitler and the Nazis never used the word swastika. That was something that other nations translating German used because they recognized the symbol. In German, it was called the Hockenkreuz, the cooked cross. And it had Christian symbolism explicitly. So we've tr- we try to get that language into bills because put it in people's minds that separate these two things for people. Like just came out in Australia. We didn't have anything to do with it. But there's a really good bill in terms of its language that was passed in the state of Victoria, which calls it the Nazi emblem or the Hawk Hock and Cruz hooked cross. And it said these you cannot be cannot be used in public outside of, you know, educational contexts and things. And it says with exception of, and they say Buddhists, Sikhs, Hindus, Jains, these uses are totally fine. And we are outside this legislation. And when talking about it, they're very specific in the language they're using. I was actually quite impressed. The, about <laughs> making that distinction. Well, here, it's water, but I'll cheers. Here, state of, state of Victoria yeah. legislators, you, you yes. did it right. There you go. Um, so that's one thing that comes up. And it's those sorts of issues that I think we're called upon to deal with frequently. So a general sense is like the media portrayal. It's the media portrayal and how that bleeds over into the public, yeah. Um, the, to crib a phrase from somebody else, I mean, there are stereotypes of like cows casting curry abound. You know, people, that's what people know. I mean, we've got some preliminary survey results that we just did that Hindu Americans and India, for that matter, are viewed pretty favorably by people in the U.S. But nevertheless, there's a dichotomy between how that's presented in the media and people's sentiment. And I don't know quite know what to make with that. I guess people aren't paying attention to what's in the media. But we still got it. It would still be nice to align those, you know, at least to bring how India, Hindus, Hinduism is reported on, on par with how other traditions are, with a similar level of respect and understanding. You can say things about Hindus, particularly in India, that if you substitute the word Jewish or Muslim in there, people would be like, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia. You know, they, they'd be screaming about it because they're like you, because it, it's unnuanced, it's painting people with a broad brush. It's judging a community by worst actors rather than the what most people think. Right. So that's what we, that's what we're up against a lot. It's a long, pro- it's a long, pro- it's a long project. Yeah. Oh, it's it's ongoing project. It never stops, right? Because it's, it's yeah, you know, always... I, I, yeah. I mean, I it's frustrating sometimes because both the community and yourself, you want to be like, I want to solve this. You know, I want people to do this accurately. I want X view to X stereotyped view to be gone. But you know, it, it's a long time coming. Why is there a bias? Why is there that bias of you know the views and how? Um. I think a lot of it stems still from colonial era scholarship that goes in, you know, that has just gone on. And academia, at least in the humanities, can be a slow mo- moving system to change. You know, established views are like, well, this is what we think. I mean, who there was somebody that said it's like it's really hard to tell get somebody to change their mind where their job depends upon it not changing. You know, and it, there's I think there's some of that. Um, you know, and it's ironic because some of the loudest voices that I think perpetuate colonial area misconceptions about India and Hinduism are people that are anti-colonial activists who are really like, colonialism was bad. The British were bad. They, they blame everything on colonialism around the world and colonialism, not defending colonialism. But they, when it comes to India, sometimes it switches and be like, 
No, the, there was an Aryan invasion and it was physical fact when the latest research on DNA and textual, textual research be like, no, it never happened actually. That, that was something that was imposed and was wrong, but it's still presented as historical fact. You know, like this whole, like a North-South Aryan Dravidian divide from a DNA perspective doesn't exist. DNA shows that it's like if people came into India from outside, it was well before any historical time period. It wasn't like some chariot driving invasion, pushing people of light skinned people, pushing dark skinned people out. DNA is like, no, never happened. You know, oh, and wow. it, it was, a, it, so it's just like, you're dealing with things like that. People aren't keeping up with the latest science, you know, is my, is my thing on it. And some of it, some of it's geopolitics. It goes back to the cold war, India was neutral or sort of aligned with the Soviet Union, five-year plan, socialism, Nehru, all of this stuff. And there was skepticism. So we were back in Pakistan. We we're back in Afghanistan against Russia. So there's some skepticism in the geopolitics still. But Pakistan's good because we've been allies with them over the years as a bulwark against the Soviets. But it's like, that's long gone. We're talking about totally different things now. India is a different country. It's entirely open. It's the world's largest demo you know, secular democracy in the world. Right. And does it have problems? Sure. It has you its know, own voice. Yeah, it, it has its own voice. Absolutely. And that's just not really recognized. You know, it's like there's a double standard, I think, applied. Yeah. You mentioned Pakistan. What is the the challenges that Hindus are facing in, in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh? Sure. Um, I mean, Afghanistan's probably pretty obvious for anybody that's following the news, particularly from the rise of the Taliban again. Um, there are, I'm looking down at my, my feet. I think I probably need two more sets of feet to count the number of Hindus and Sikhs in Afghanistan still. You know, I, they're not that many. Um, there was obviously historically a vibrant population that particularly in the past couple of decades has been totally driven out. Um, in Pakistan, I mean, I probably don't need to go into partition with people, but you know, it, it's just been a declining population. And in, and in recent years, increasing, there's been persecution of all minority faiths in Pakistan, um, a growing conservatism that treats Hindus, Christians, Sikhs, and even, you know, Muslim sects that aren't the, the predominant one badly. Ahmadiyya Muslims aren't considered Muslim in Pakistan. You know, you can be arrested. You can be, you can, you're not considered, you're not, you're, you're not a real Muslim and you're very much persecuted. So that, that's the, that's the situation. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it's not, it, it's not good. I mean, they're the refugees in India that we work with. We've provided medical aid to, you know, trying to raise awareness around that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I want to quickly move on to the, we talked a little bit about Hindu phobia. Yeah, sure. uh, I want to have one particular question about it is, uh, so Hindu phobia in, in America, this is uh, specifically, uh, mm -hmm. does entering politics, like having Hindu American politicians entering the race and mm -hmm. you know, winning a seat, does that make a difference in, in the grand scheme of things? I think it, think it does. There are not that many Hindu politicians in the U.S. There are more than people may think, particularly when you go out of the national spotlight. But my last count, maybe with Tulsi Gabbard not in office, there it's it's skewed a little bit. But I think it's actually proportional. Hindus is a proportion of members of Congress. I believe it's proportional as a percentage to Hindus in the United States, and that's something that's saying something. That's that I think that's a good thing. You know. I think there's some constraints on the system. You know, it's like you can only do so much. And there's a, if you enter into national politics, there's a certain, there's certain something you, you, you participate in and buy into. So there's only so much Hinduness, if you will, that you can bring to it, you know, because the system is what it is. I, I, but I think it, it, it's undoubtedly a good thing. I mean, it's brought some people out of the woodwork, you know, that are, I can describe as only anti Hindu bigots who there's their websites up attacking Hindu politicians specifically because to certain members of the 
anti-India brigade, again, sounding rather uncle in saying that, they just being Hindu, being in the room with somebody that might have a tie to the Indian government means you're a member of the RSS and you want to ban bikinis and you want to persecute Muslims and every other stereotype out there. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, it doesn't matter your policies. You're, you know, you're bad. There's other ones attacking Raja Krishnamurti and from Illinois, from Padma Kupa, who's a state politician in Michigan, who used to be a board member of HAF. Um, and they go after them. They go after people like Naraj Antani on the other side, who is a very conservative Republican in, uh, in Ohio. He's a member of the Ohio legislature. Doesn't matter. They're being attacked because they're Hindu and they think they have ties to the Indian government. You know, it, it goes back. It's analogous to, I don't know if any listeners were alive then, I wasn't, uh, when John F. Kennedy was attacked for being Catholic. Can a Catholic be a president of the United States? Will he have dual loyalty to the Pope or the United States? It's the same, it, it's similar language, you know? Or somebody, or, or some Jewish politician be like, well, are you gonna take your orders from, you know, somebody in Israel? Or are you going to be loyal here? It's a similar thing. It's, pol it's global politics that bleed into the US in ways that it's just frustrating sometimes, yeah. you know, it's, and it goes to the double standard that I think exists right now. Yeah, and no, I think you guys are doing a great job and the American Foundation is doing a great job of, uh, you know, uh, spreading the word and educating people and advocating for Hindus all across America. Uh, I wanna switch gears and move on to environmentalism because that's very, very sure. close to your heart. Uh, is. What, is, what is the Hindu view around environment, protecting mm -hmm. the environment, saving the environment, or, uh, and how can we become more aware of the environment around us and how we're sure. consuming resources, for example? I would say that the distinction between the Hindu view on the environment, and you can say this about the Dharmic perspective broadly versus Abrahamic traditions, is that there, in Abrahamic traditions, there's often talk of stewardship, that the planet has been given to us and we have to be good stewards of it in the sense of we're taking care of it. The, the Hindu view, you know, we are no different. We are as divine as anything else. We should respect all creatures. There may be a difference in outward manifestation, but we all have that same divine spark in us. So everything is our brother and sisters. Everything is divine. The, you know, the little cactus outside on my porch out here is, you know, is a living being. The hummingbirds that come by. We're all variations of this divinity. So all of that should be respected. You know, we can personify rivers and we don't have to do that naively and be like, well, that's a living being in the same way a person is, but we can have that spiritual connection to it that isn't there in other traditions or is not as prominent. So I think that is the distinguishing factor of it, you know, um, and I think that has profound implications. You know, we, it, if you truly take that on, it, it gives a level of devotion and worship and sacredness to your actions. It's not simply, well, I have to preserve this watershed because it'll give me clean water. It's this thing has a life form. It's a life, it's, it's a life to itself in a way. It's a form of consciousness, if you will. And that's worth having a relationship with. You know, it's not, it's closer to many indigenous perspectives, not to flatten them because there are serious distinctions, but there's a sense of relationship that I think is sometimes lacking in other traditions with the natural world that is present in Hinduism. And that's what I think it really offers and what we can teach the world or offer is, you know, a different perspective that you can take that on. Yeah. What's uh, one way that we can all implement that kind of thinking in our life? Um, I'm trying to give you something simple. I once did this in college. I did this project where for 30 days, I tried to see everything as a version of Shakti, everything. Like flies would land on me. And I'd be like, that is a goddess landing on me. That was weird. And after a while, it, like, it really gets into you. And so I don't want to give people something that's that hard. 
So the <laughs> discipline. It's a serious discipline. I was inspired because I had been reading at the time the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, who said who was so in touch with the grass, if I remember the story properly, like he could feel it. He could feel its energy when he was sitting on it. And it was just like it went up into him. I'm like, that's really intense. I don't know if I can do this. But I was inspired by it. So I think in terms of more simple things, I mean, if you're not already vegetarian, cut back. You know, I don't want to dictate to people. I, I, don't, I don't really like prescribing things to people, but really cut back. It's one of the biggest things that you can do. It, 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 it both helps your health. It helps the planet in terms of resources. It helps in what sense animal it, suffering. In what sense does it help the planet? Um, the, there are a couple of ways. Um, the most prominent that you'll read about is that animal agriculture is <clears throat> highly resource intensive and the carbon footprint, the greenhouse gases that it produces um, are orders of magnitude bigger than a vegetarian diet, even more so vegan. We won't go there. Um, but I, that's even better. They're, they're gradations. Vegan is awesome for the environment. Um, it, so that's the big one. Also, water pollution, these big factory farms that we were talking about before, biofuels, have massive waste ponds. They pollute water everywhere. Um, also, in other parts of the world, not so much the U.S., it's like conversion of land. You know, like plantations in the Amazon going for beef. Also go for soy, but bigger part is beef. Mm -hmm. So they're cutting down rainforests. <clears throat> Excuse me. Very practical use of water. Um, so that's the that's the benefit when you're eating a plant-based diet my god my throat my my voice is going um <coughs> excuse me almost done take a couple sips together <sighs> when you're eating a plant-based diet it um it brings you down in terms of your environmental impact um, so that, I mean, that, that's the biggest thing environmentally, the health benefits are also there. So it's choose your, choose your way in. Do you want to improve your health? Do you want to improve the planetary health? Hey, what you can do. Wrong. Yeah. Do you want and to not earth, hurt animals? Exactly. Animal cruelty. Yeah. And the other thing that I read about, uh, I think you had written an article, uh, about how much water lettuce uses like one uh one pound of lettuce versus that's one pound so funny man that you're you're digging deep into the archive that's funny that is the first article i was asked the first time i was ever on national public radio i got asked to write about that to come and comment on that um yeah i don't remember the stats off the top of my head even even plants have varying degrees of a water footprint that's a and some are much higher than others frankly i think you're unless you're already really committed and you're really into sort of fine tuning your environmental footprint, don't worry about that one. At the time mm -hmm. I might've said different because I was writing about it. Just cut out the, if you cut out the meat, cut out the dairy or like at least really reduce it, you're doing more. Once you've already done that, okay, fine. Maybe we can talk about, well, maybe I should be eating al almonds or hazelnuts because one has a different, you know, water footprint or environmental footprint but don't do that it's like like if you're trying to lose weight and you don't know how many calories you're eating first get that under control and then worry about weight should i be eating more protein more carbohydrates maybe i need these nutrients until you get that baseline of i'm not eating too much right that don't get into that detail it's not it's sense. not as important yeah yeah no that definitely makes sense one thing i was uh astonished to see on this list i just have it pulled up right now is butter yeah. takes almost two thousand more than two thousand gallons mm -hmm. to produce one pound of butter i was butter it, 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 from an environmental perspective dairy is way up there way up there um, yeah that was a surprise for me um yeah. all right i think uh you know this is this is a great time to let's talk a little bit about the haf uh there's something yeah. about uh, dharma advocates and dharma ambassadors sure that. yeah okay two programs dharma ambassadors is the first one dharma ambassadors is a, is a monthly class we have it's uh for free saturdays um i believe it's the second saturday of every month um it's on the website i 
I don't, I just schedule them. Um, and it's for people to come in to learn how to talk about Hinduism. It's not a, it's not a Balavir hard class. It's nothing to talk about theology so much. It's about how to talk about Hinduism to non-Hindus and to frankly other Hindus too. I mean, in a coherent way that makes sense in a mod in the modern world. It's there it goes over a number of topics, both from history, different lineages, all sorts of things like that. Dharma, Dharma advocates, we used to have more frequently sort of fell off a little bit in the pandemic because that is about how to learn how to advocate for specific issues or specific bills in Congress or something. And once we weren't able to actually go to congressional offices or in, in things in person, it sort of fell off. We're starting to do those a little bit more again. So those will happen more infrequently, but that's a little more political side of things. So you want to come in through the door saying, this is how I can talk about Hinduism broadly and Hindus in the United States go to Dharma ambassadors. You want to do go even farther, look for there's Dharma advocates, you know, farther in the sense of I want to advocate for something very specific. Like we've had ones on how to talk about what's going on in Kashmir. We've had ones to talk about, you know, what's the what's the story about caste in the sense of historically, what what is true, what's not true, what where is discrimination happening? Because there are a lot, we could have four podcasts, on, four episodes on the history of caste to talk about all the nuances on that, you know, and where that and how that is. I mean, for the record, HAF's point is nobody should be discriminating on caste. This is not, this is totally against Hinduism, but as a fact of social life for in India and to a lesser degree in the diaspora, it's a factor. It, it, it's out there, despite it being outlawed in India and all this. And we need to talk about it. So we have a class. We have a class on how we can talk about this without resorting to things like the only feature of Hinduism is caste, is, which is things you hear out there that most Hindus, at least I encounter, are like, really? It's not what I. Nobody, no Swami I hear is talking about that. You know. So we have things on that, or we've had ones on like immigration and different issues like that. Um, so that's the distinction. I believe I, I won't interrupt my camera by going up here and looking it up, but people can go to the website www.hinduamerican.org. Over in the navigation, on the all the way to the right, there's a drop down, and you can go to find out when the latest classes are. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. I really, yes. really appreciate everything that you've yes. shared today. Uh, thank I, you so I, much. I thought we were going to get. I thought we were going to get to you know some random questions here. I guess I was yes. for boats. We're running out yes. of time. Let's, let's do that right now. Let's do that right now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to ask you to pick a number from 1 to 100, and yes. I'll ask you a particular question related to that. Okay. What's your number? 1 to 100. 52. Ooh, that's a 52. Right. 52. We got... Okay. The question is, what is the most inspiring thing you have seen someone do? Oh, wow. Wow. And I only have two minutes. I may sit here in silence having to cont contemplate this one. Um, or that you have done. The most inspiring thing I've done. Um, I'll say the People's Climate March. Like marching in the streets of New York. I don't know what it accomplished, but it was very inspiring to be out there seeing so many people. Just hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people out there in the streets, knowing you are a part of history, knowing you're a part of something so big while it's happening. It's just like, it, it's very inspiring. Wow. It, wow. It, it was a good thing. I'm gonna clap that. All awesome, thank you so much, Matt. I really thank appreciate you. your time. I appreciate everything that you have shared. Uh, love and abundance, and let's have one final set together. I don't know if I have any left, I'll pretend. There we go. There we go, man. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you.